Welcome, welcome. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. All right, welcome to this webinar on the 2023 Chicago mayoral election, Reclaiming Harold Washington's Multiracial Coalition. I wanna thank all of you for being here. We were allowing a little bit of time for people to come in and I see that people are still coming in, but I'm gonna go ahead and get going here. I am Teresa Cordova, director of the Great Cities Institute at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Welcome to all of you near and far. We very much appreciate your interest, not only in this topic, but in this very important election um, that we are all talking about here in Chicago. If you lived through the Harold Washington uh, administration or the rise of Harold Washington, um, you might know how important it was to us, how important he was to us. Um, it, he arose um, out of very much of a, of, of a desire for independence, particularly or specifically from a very entrenched political machine. The Chicago political machine um, is, is, an, is uh, infamous, shall we say, for having been very tightly run um, and having been really the source uh, for, for patronage favors um, and really a, 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 an example of patronage politics. But in this push for independence, um, in which Harold Washington was, was really the charismatic leader, um, it really required a coalition. It, it required, first of all, awakening of, uh, of the city's Black population, which had increased in size since the 1940s especially. Um, but it was also made possible because of the coalition um, with Latinos and with progressive whites. And it very much was a progressive multiracial coalition. And it made, it made a difference, it made a difference. And so today, as there has been talk about um, this election and coming together in, in coalitions, what does a progressive multiracial coalition look like? And so our concern, really our focus is thinking about bringing ideas and thoughts to our conversations and our concerns about this election. Um, but by bringing forward this very important legacy of this very brilliant, wonderful, kind, um, truly just wonderful human being uh, by way of Harold Washington. And we, um, you know, we try to avoid thinking about um, what life would have been like if he had um, uh, lived past that fateful day in, in 1987, but his yeah. legacy lives on. Um, and so we have with us today, um, Juan Gonzalez, who will be the moderator. You all know Juan, he's from Democracy Now! Um, and the author of a very important book that is used in uh, classrooms across the country called Harvest of Empire. Um, also, um, and I'll let him go into detail, introduce our panelists, but the panelists have written very important books, one of which is very recent. And we thought this would be a wonderful occasion um, to bring you all together uh, to talk about this very important topic. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Juan Gonzalez, who will, will mediate our panel or moderate our panel today. Juan, thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Teresa, and good evening to uh, all of you here. I want to thank, first of all, Great Cities Institute and the History Department uh, of UIC for sponsoring this evening's event. Uh, I'll be moderating what's a very timely panel, given that this uh, mayoral election in Chicago is uh, is next week. Uh, and we have a wonderful lineup of three brilliant scholars who have spent decades studying and analyzing the modern history of Chicago. Uh, my own experience in this great city is a limited one, since I only relocated here a few months ago after spending my entire life on the East Coast, uh, mostly in New York City and uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, but the issue of political change through radical multiracial movements is one I've chronicled and analyzed for years. Uh, as a youth, I was a founding member of the New York Lords, Young Lords, and we, along with our parent group, the Chicago Lords and their leader, Chacha Jimenez, were part of the famous Rainbow Coalition with the legendary Black Panther Party and Young Patriots. Years later, I participated as an activist in the multiracial movement that toppled Philadelphia's notorious 
right-wing mayor Frank Rizzo from power in, 19, in a 1978 voter referendum, and later chronicled as a young reporter how the movement elected Philly's first Black mayor, Wilson Good, in 1983, with some two-thirds of Latinos voting for Good. That was only weeks after Harold Washington's victory in Chicago. Uh, then in 1989, as a columnist for the New York Daily News, I was an eyewitness reporter to David Dinkins' successful multiracial movement that propelled him to become the city's first Black mayor and covered the mistakes of the Dinkins administration that led to his defeat by Rudy Giuliani uh, for mayor in 1993. In each case, the victorious multiracial coalitions proved to be temporary, though each left an indelible mark on the politics of those cities. Of those victories, Washington's was the most important. The electrifying Jesse Jackson campaigns of 1984 uh, uh, and 1988 and Barack Obama's presidential victory in 2008 and 2012 were due in no small measure to the strategy that first gained success in Chicago in 1983. To a lot of you young people, this may seem like ancient history, when in fact, these past struggles are full of vital lessons about the interplay between race, class, and people's power, about how you build not only a progressive multiracial solidarity in the electoral arena, but how to govern once progressives come to power and how to nurture and maintain the movement's unity. So I've asked each panelist to uh, give us some opening remarks for uh, seven to 10 minutes on the key lessons they've drawn from the Harold Washington era and the movements that led up to that. After that, I'm gonna throw out a few questions to the panelists for discussions, and then we're gonna open the webinar to a few written questions from you in the audience. And we hope to wrap all of this up by 7 p.m. Central Time. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, first uh, uh, panelist to, uh, to speak, that's, uh, Dr. Jacoby Williams, who's the Ruth and Walt Halls Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies uh, at the Department of History at, uh, and also with the Department of History at Indiana University Bloomington. He's a civil rights, Black power, social justice, and African American history scholar. His most recent book, From the Bullet to the Ballot, the, the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party and Racial Coalition Politics in Chicago, was published by University of North Carolina Press and became the foundation for the script to the multi-Oscar award-winning Warner Brothers film, Judas and the Black Messiah. And if you haven't seen that film, you definitely need to see it. Uh, his other uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications have appeared in the Journal for Civil and Human Rights, Black Perspectives, uh, and uh, 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 Black Women, Gender, and Families, the Journal of Pan-African Studies, and also it was appeared in Jacobin Magazine, uh, Mother Jones, Gawker Vox, and the uh, Indianapolis Star. He's appeared in dozens of media programs, uh, in radio, television. He's also held positions at UCLA, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the University of Kentucky. So, Jacoby, take it away. Greetings, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully, it cooperates with me. There we are. All righty. Um, I'm going to give you some historical context. Just give you a roadmap of where we're going. Start my timing here so I don't go over my allotted time. We are um, in the process of discussing the current election, but what I want to provide us is a, a glimpse of 1968, between 1968 and 1983, the creation of the original Rainbow Coalition, then the election of our first African American mayor in the city of Chicago, Ho Washington. And so I use this photo as an attention getter, but I'll come back to it um, throughout the, uh, the presentation today. I'll start here with the book, um, as Juan is introduced. As much of what I'm sharing with you can be found um, in this particular text. Um, what the underlying argument is of the text is not by accident. The Black first president, Barack Obama, comes out of Chicago using racial coalition politics. It's not a new phenomenon, at least not in the Chicago context. Um, and then I also introduce you to these three films, um, all of which use the book for the, the various reasons. Uh, the Vanguard of the Party, Stanley Nelson documenting the Black Panther Party, it's a 22-minute segment on Chicago with Fred Hampton that I did all the research for. Uh, if you're interested in a visual 
copy of the book, uh, The First Rainbow Coalition by Ray Sastaban, the PBS documentary. It is my book in a documentary form from beginning to end. And then if you're also interested in Warner Brothers film, Jews and the Black Messiah, the book was used to write the script. I don't endorse this film, not as a biopic or a movie of Fred Hampton. Happy to discuss that more in Q&A. Uh, I don't say you're not to see the film, but it's not a, a accurate portrayal. I would argue that you should look at the, the documentary The Murder of Fred Hampton or either other two documentaries that appear there. But nevertheless, the book had a major impact in those three particular categories. So here's just some visual references for students in the room, uh, for those of you who have access to uh, PBS documentaries, YouTubes, and just want to watch a Hollywood vision version of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so who are the original Rainbow Coalition? So I begin here with uh, the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, represented by Bob Lee and Fred Hampton. This is very much a migration history, as much of the party members in Illinois and all these particular groups are migrated to Chicago for various reasons. So Bob Lee, um, who I talk about in a second, is from Houston, Texas. Fred Hampton, his family is from Louisiana. Um, and most of the members of the Black Panther Party's families have migrated north. The Young Patriots, these are Confederate flag wearing Southern whites from the foothills of Appalachia, from West Virginia, all the way down to Alabama, who also migrated to Chicago looking for uh, economic opportunities. And then the Young Lords, who are Puerto Ricans, who I migrate from the East Coast, the island of Puerto Rico, also merging onto Chicago for economic reasons as well. Those three groups make up the original Rainbow Coalition. And much later, you get groups like Rise of Angry, uh, represented by Mike James and others. These are part of the student left who migrate to Chicago uh, for the Democratic National Convention during the protests there and end up staying and eventually fall into the fold as members of the original Rainbow Coalition. So who are some of these people? Here's Bill Preacherman Festerman uh, with Confederate flag. He's actually from North Carolina. Um, here is my guy, my dog, Jose Chacha Jimenez of the Young Lords, um, Puerto Rican community. Um, here's Mike James, the Rise of Angry. Um, so go back a bit. The Panthers are located on the west side of Chicago. Uh, the Young Patriots are located on the north side of Chicago and uptown. The Young Lords at this time are in Lincoln Park where they're fighting urban renewal and gentrification force removal. And then Rise of Angry is also located on the north side in Logan Square. Um, and here's Fred Hampton, who I argue is the most important political figure of the 20th century that unfortunately too many people have never heard of. He is one of the, uh, the icons of this movement, who's one of the martyrs of, our, of this particular political episode. So here are the two brainchilds of the Rainbow Coalition, Bob Lee and Fred Hampton. Bob Lee is, his original name is Robert E. Lee III, but he's not named after the Confederate general. He's named after his grandfather, who was an organizer for the Longshoremen's Union, just happened to have that name, which will come in key when he brings in the Young Patriots and Fred Hampton. So Fred Hampton becomes the de facto leader of this organization, even though there's no real technical brick and mortar organization, no real leader, but because of his oratory skills and his charismatic leadership, he becomes the de facto leader. But it's really Bob Lee, who's the mover and shaker of the Rainbow Coalition. He's the one in the community bringing folks into the fold, organizing, as you can see here in this particular episode, um, or this particular photo, I'm sorry, of organizing the poor white Appalachian community on the north side of Chicago. So um, I said a little bit about some of these other groups as well, because I don't want to give this misconception the Panthers doing all the leading. These are organic intellectuals who are all bringing something to the fold. For example, here's Chuck Geary. He's a member of um, Joint Community Union. Um, jobs and Income Now is an acronym with offshoots of students, students for a Democratic Society and some of these other groups at the time. What he does is these buttons that he's wearing on his lapel, he and, and a number of the young patriots, uh, what he does is break into the act, the offices of the Nixon Agnew campaign, uh, who's running for president at the time. And he liberates these buttons and he repaints them, red for indigenous folks, yellow for Asian Americans, white for what we call working class hillbillies, um, black for African Americans, brown for Latinos. And he began to pass these buttons out because at the time this group didn't have a didn't have a name. So Fred Hampton gets a, a hold of one of these buttons and, and says, This is great, Chuck. What we're going to call ourselves is the Rainbow Coalition, thus coining the term. Again, no Jesse Jackson. So here is a photo, one of the most famous photos of the organization. It's held on April 4th, 1969, to commemorate the one year anniversary of the murder and assassination of Martin Luther King as the coalition is advocating to the world. No longer will they allow the capitalist enterprises to divide and conquer them by race. They're going to transcend these so called racial differences 
and join forces under what they call uh, class solidarity to continue the kind of work that King was doing. So here on the right, you see Frito and Louis Cusa, the Young Lords. In the middle, you have the Panthers with U.S. Congressman Bobby Rush, who I'm sure we talk about today. In the back against the wall is Mike James from Rise of Angry and Bill Pitcherman, freshman with that Confederate flag, High Thurman, some of my key organizers still to this day. Um, together, they of the young young patriots. Together, they make up the original Rainbow Coalition. Here in um, here, just I, I only use this photo to demonstrate some of the other groups who who come in later. Icons like Mike Klonsky of the of the, of the left or, the white organizing left. You have Latin American Defense Organization. Some of the other groups could come in the fold later. Um, and then just imagine these two people walking in the room right now. Even in our current context today, um, this unapologetically black. Black Panther regalia with this racist Confederate flag, joining forces, holding hands, talking about their brothers of the struggle, to look past their so-called symbols and look at their humanity, what they have in common, their humanity and their poverty as brothers of the struggle, the transcend class, transcend racial differences in terms of for class solidarity. This is the kind of work that King and others were doing that they continued at the time. And so it sounds great, but what really brought these groups together? It was the program. So here I give you a list of these programs, there's several of them, and I'll go through some of them really quickly because I don't have much time, but the programs are successful and the programs are the glue that bring those particular coalitions together, the particular communities together. Chicago then still is the most racially residential segregated city in America, but it's the women. Uh, most of the women in the organization, particularly Black Panther Party, almost 80% were women with membership. And these women were the real movers and shakers that kept the organization afloat. And many of them ran these programs. The most popular program happens to be their free breakfast for children program. The Panthers were feeding about 5,000 um, poor and underserved communities, um, children every morning um, prior, to, prior to school. Well, they would set up these free breakfast programs and then they'd go in and show folks how to set up some of these as well. Now, women ran these organizations, but men did all the cooking and cleaning. Again, challenging so-called gender norms. So here's just some quick photos of what the free breakfast program looked like on the Better Boys Foundation on the west side of Chicago. Uh, some more photos here again. Um, he, and then the Panthers would go into Uptown and help these poor whites, these Appalachians, set up their free breakfast programs. So here's their free breakfast program, the Young Patriots. Here's Rising Up Angry's free breakfast program. Just to give you an idea, since the programs, that's the glue that brought these coalitions together. The Panthers created this Spurgeon Jack Winners Free Clinic. Uh, what make this so profound is Quentin Young, who is the Cook County Health Commissioner at the time, runs their clinic. So all these doctors at the University of Chicago and Northwestern who have to put, spend their residency somewhere, they've used those residencies in these clinics. So here you can see a real pediatrician, women can see real gynecologists in these particular programs. Then the Panthers will go on and help um, set up these same programs for the Young Patriots, Rise of Angry and others, and all the other groups of the coalition. I'm deliberately not discussing Young Lords in detail because my other colleagues will as well. So here's some rallies just to demonstrate how this works. You will see typically a, a narrow focus of the Panthers speaking at these rallies, but in this picture where the cameras panned out, you can see everyone's here as a coalition working in solidarity. So whatever the issue is, you lead it that we all show up in solidarity. In this case, it's a free Huey rally and all the coalition shows up. Here's Fred Hampton speaking at UIC, where he does here, he doesn't bring any Panthers, he's bringing the young lords with him to demonstrate our Latino brothers and sisters uh, brown brothers and sisters issues are equally important as African-Americans in terms of poverty. Um, here is uh, the, the Young Lords in taking over the McCormick Theological Seminary. Here's some more rallies at the time. They're protesting police brutality against the Young Lords that lead these rallies, but everyone shows up in solidarity. Um, here's another one against police brutality led by the Young Lords uh, for Pedro Medina. You even see a picture of um, uh, one of the Panthers, Larry Robeson, who was murdered, but everyone shows up in solidarity. Here's another one of those rallies with a young Juan Gonzalez participating in Chicago with some of these particular episodes at the time. Um, and also, just imagine this photo here, and I'm going to end it soon because I think I have about less than a minute. Um, here, just imagine Fred Hampton speaking downtown Chicago at the band shell. There's about 5,000 people, people coming here and speak, and you have your Confederate flag, so the whites who are doing security for them at the time. So I'll just go through some of these photos real quick just so you can see what the period looked like what the, these organizations look like. This is the photo I chose to use for my book cover because I just couldn't put that Confederate flag on the cover of my book, but that's a conversation for another day. And because of that, Fred Hampton's assassinated for assassination. It's the Rainbow Coalition is why primarily he's a targeted for assassination. He's able to bring all these particular people into the fold. Here the Red Squad demonstrates in their racist rhetoric how he's rehabilitated 
because they murdered him in all these various ways. Um, so after Frey Happen is assassinated, they figured they, the state, that the movement would end, but it actually governed as a movement. So you have this conglomeration of the FBI and Chicago police joining forces to murder this 20 year old kid in his, in his sleep. Why? Because not even Martin Luther King or Malcolm X can get Confederate flags, Southern whites, some of which were white supremacists, to join forces with them and form these kinds of coalitions with Puerto Ricans and Native Americans and others in a way that he was able to do so. So they began this election campaign to um, force out who they saw as the main culprit in assassination which was Edward Harrenhan. Um, they went around and, and changed most of his re-election sign to convict Harrenhan. And then folks began to run for office. So when Fred Hampton assassinated, who picks up the mold for the Rainbow Coalition? The Puerto Ricans. Chacha Jimenez becomes the leader of the Rainbow Coalition. Why? Because unfortunately, Bobby Rush wasn't just as charismatic uh, or of the, as an organized leader as Chacha and Fred Hampton was. So Chacha becomes the leader Puerto Ricans pick up the mode of the Rainbow Coalition. Cha-Cha runs for office. I'll let my colleagues speak more about that in a second. Um, and then it merges into what we call the Intercommunity Service Committee. Um, the Rainbow Coalition emerges into all these various organizations as they run others for office. Here's uh, some of those legacies here in Uptown with the Fred Hampton Memorial Hall as many of the Panthers programs, the community service programs continue. And then Harold Washington is elected as the first African-American mayor of Chicago. He runs on the Rainbow Coalition ticket. All these same people I'm mentioning from the Panthers to the Young Lord to Young Patriots, organize his campaign, get out the vote for his campaign. Chacha Jimenez, for example, his North Side campaign, precinct captain is, is organizing for his campaign. And when he's elected, he creates what he calls his rainbow cabinet. And for the first time in Chicago history, Latinos, African-Americans, women, even people with disability have real political power. And he creates this rainbow cabinet to fight this democratic machine. And Jesse Jackson co-ops co the, the title the Rainbow Coalition, and we can talk about that in question and answer as well. And um, I end there because I know I'm way over my 10 minutes at that time. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, thanks. That was a terrific, uh, a, a terrific uh, and fast uh, presentation, uh, Jacoby. And uh, now I want to introduce our second uh, uh, presenter. Uh, and uh, that's someone who I... Uh, know quite well. Uh, and uh, let me just see if I can get her bio up here because I'm having trouble with my, my I should know it by heart because she happens to be my wife as well, uh, is uh, Lilia Fernandez. Uh, uh, Lilia is a professor of history at, at UIC. Um, uh, she is a 20th century US historian who focus, whose work focuses on Latinos, urban politics, and economic equality. Her first book, Brown in the Windy City, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in Post-War Chicago, was published by University of Chicago Press in 2012. Uh, she's currently working on a, another book on Latinos, workers, students, and elites in Chicago. She was born in, and raised in Chicago and is a founder and director of Latino New Jersey History Project, uh, she has taught previously at Ohio State University and at Rutgers. So, Lilia, you're on. Thank you so much, um, Juan. And I just want to start by saying um, what a treat, what an honor to be here with such highly esteemed um, colleagues. Uh, Jacoby, thank you so much for that uh, presentation and for those amazing photographs, really. Um, so I uh, just wanted to talk very briefly. Let me uh, share my screen here. See if this will work. So I just wanted to say a, a bit about the Latino population in Chicago. Uh, one that I know well, that I've written about, um, that I have belonged to for uh, many years uh, and have just returned to, um, and talk a little bit about the history of the city's demographics and really the conditions of possibility for multiracial coalitions that um, Jacoby has spoken on and that Gordon will go into greater detail upon. So, I tend to uh, begin my discussions of uh, Latino history in Chicago with um, this table here, because this really is a dominant narrative um, that has captured so much of the history of the city and the way that people understand its residents, its uh, demographic change, 
and um, what has been at the heart of social and political um, conflicts, struggles, and um, you know, efforts for social justice and empowerment. The large um, influx of Southern African Americans, primarily in the mid 20th century, uh, folks coming from the South uh, in, of the country, and then uh, accompanied with that, the dramatic outmigration of white Chicagoans, uh, particularly to the surrounding suburbs. And you see these figures um, really capture that numerically, what that looked like. Um, and of course, behind uh, these simple numbers, we know that this represents um, enormous struggles for uh, fair representation, for resources, for social justice, um, and for power in the city. So my question then um, for us, or you know, what I'd like to contribute is thinking about where do Latinos fit into this, um, this narrative? In some ways, um, Latinos struggle with the dual challenge of being on the one hand invisible um, or, or um, being marked by invisibility, but on the other hand, also being hypervisible. And I'll say more about that in a second. So um, as I've reflected on this really um, primarily here in Chicago, but also in other places around the country, in many ways, Latinos are often cast as always newcomers, right? Um, as recent arrivals, uh, often politically marginalized historically. That has changed, I will um, point out, in the last several decades here locally. And in large part, it's as it has been as a result of that rainbow coalition that um, Jacoby talked about and that Gordon will talk about that helped to catapult Harold Washington into City Hall as the first African-American mayor that began to um, also open up doors for uh, Latinos in the city. Um, third, in terms of this um, uh, characterization of Latinos as invisible, I, was, um, I would ask us to consider whether as a population, uh, Latinos continue to be cast as negligible um, uh, as a people without a history. If we're always newcomers, if we're always just recently arrived, then what do, people know, what do we know collectively about our past? And I would submit to you that there is a tremendous and rich past that we uh, might be interested in exploring and uh, learning more about. And I say that as someone who's a third generation Chicagoan, um, whose grandparents immigrated to uh, the city from uh, Mexico and Texas in the 1950s, and someone who's um, continuously uh, curious and hungry for more knowledge about that past and that history. So that's a bit about the ways in which Latinos are um, marked as invisible in the city. Now, on the other hand, of course, uh, there's a way in which Latinos are hypervisible and particularly in very negative ways, right? Either as um, delinquent or criminal or as troublemakers engaged in um, activities or um, practices that uh, disrupt local norms, that um, cause problems, et cetera, but all also hypervisible as illegitimate members of society. Right. Um, if you scan through the local newspapers, the Chicago Tribune, the Sun Times, uh, particularly starting with the 1970s, for example, you see repeatedly so much coverage of undocumented immigration and the casting of um, Mexican immigrants in particular as interlopers, as unlawful, um, as not as people who do not belong. So. I want to um, turn next then to thinking about the places where people like the Latino population have interacted and encountered others. And in this case, particularly African Americans. And there's no place that embodies this or that provided those opportunities more um, or better than any other place, I would say, than Maxwell Street. Um, Maxwell Street, historically, these photos are from the 1950s and 60s, if I'm not mistaken. And this really was a 
place of encounter for Latinos, um, African Americans, whites, and many others uh, who came to shop and um, find entertainment and um, just be in community with one another. We know that Chicago is a horribly segregated city, often uh, remarked as, as the most segregated in the country. And yet, I think that we really need to pay um, particular attention to the moments and the places where people of different racial backgrounds have encountered one another and have come together. In many cases, this has been marked by conflict, um, by tensions um, as well, but uh, in so many other um, places, these, these um, encounters have been, in mark, have been marked by friendship, by the building of solidarity, and even by love. And we can think about um, neighborhoods like um, the near west side, the near north side, um, west town and Humboldt Park, uptown, um, and elsewhere in the city where Latinos, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Native Americans, and whites, and many others have encountered one another. Uh, we can think about schools. Uh, and I can personally speak of my own experience, uh, you know, going to Chicago public schools in the 1970s and 80s when the city was belatedly trying to desegregate them. Uh, we can think also about workplaces where uh, particularly service workers, um, low wage laborers, uh, working class people have encountered each other and formed bonds with one another, cooperated and fought for better wages, better working conditions, um, and uh, an improved work experience um, overall. Now, I wanna um, say something very briefly uh, also about some of the challenges and the conditions that Latinos have experienced in the city, very similar in many cases to African-Americans. Many of the same abuses by local police, um, discrimination in housing, in employment, um, and violence and other forms of um, social dispossession uh, that African Americans also have experienced. And of course, we need to be mindful of the differences in those experiences, the ways in which African Americans and Latinos, uh, for example, might have encounters with law enforcement uh, based on their distinct racialization that has um, marked them in different ways and that has uh, had different outcomes and results for them in those encounters. But as uh, Jacoby Williams suggested, it really was the period of the late 1960s and early 70s when uh, young Puerto Ricans, Chicanos, African Americans, uh, poor whites, uh, Native Americans began to see exactly what they had in, in common. The ways in which they were being displaced and dispossessed by urban renewal policies, the ways in which they were being brutalized by the Chicago Police Department. And um, it really has been these moments of coming together that have demonstrated the greatest power, people power, as they called it at the time, um, that have uh, helped us imagine a different way. Um, new ways of relating to each other and um, to imagine a, a different type of society. And I know there are quite a number of folks in the audience right now this evening with us uh, who lived through this era and who were uh, uh, had firsthand experience as participants in these social struggles. So I would love to hear comments, um, recollections and, and feedback from them. So let me end by um, really, again, honing in on that multiracial coalition building, which Gordon will uh, say more about, particularly in relation to Harold Washington. Um, the Rainbow Coalition of this period between the Panthers, the, the Young Lords, the Young Patriots, other groups like LADO, the Latin American Defense uh, Organization, which took up the issue of welfare rights that brought together Puerto Rican, Chicana, and African-American women in um, trying to uh, fight for a greater social welfare support 
uh, locally. And um, finally, of course, the electoral representation and struggles over redistricting. The last thing, um, two, two final things I want to point to. One is that um, our host this evening, um, Teresa Cordova, who's um, graciously helped co-sponsor this event, has written a fantastic uh, chapter on uh, titled Harold Washington and the Rise of Latino Electoral Politics in Chicago, 1982 to 1987. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it, I highly recommend it. It's in the book edited by uh, Chicano historian David Montejano called Chicano Politics and Society in the Late 20th Century. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, it's an excellent analysis of uh, the rise of Latino electoral politics during the Washington um, years. But I, um, I want to say one final thing about the difference between um, coalition and solidarity. And I really got this lesson from a local priest, um, Father Don Headley, who some of you may be familiar with, um, who I spoke to a few years ago and um, really impressed upon me just how important solidarity is. In some ways, coalition might suggest strategic or calculated political alliances um, with the aim of you know, obtaining uh, specific benefits. Whereas solidarity, I think, really speaks to the recognition of shared struggles, of what we have in common with one another as human beings and how we might work together to ease our collective suffering. So I wanna suggest that um, what these historical actors have shown us in the past, what the Washington um, coalition um, taught us as well, is that we can get much farther working together rather than being divided, um, particularly along, along racial lines. Um, putting that into practice, of course, is extremely challenging, but um, I think that Gordon will be able to share some more lessons with us from the Washington administration. So I will stop there and turn it over to him. Thank you so much. Oh, I will turn it back to Juan, who will introduce him. Okay. Apologies. Uh, thanks, Lilia. Uh, and um, our our final panelist is uh, Gordon Mantler, who is the uh, executive director of the University Writing Program and associate professor of writing and of history at George Washington University. His research specializes in U.S. social justice movements, multiracial coalitions, public history memorialization and film and writing pedagogy in history classes. His book, The Multiracial Promise, Harold Washington's Chicago and the Democratic Struggle in Reagan's America has just been published just uh, about a week ago, Gordon, by University of North Carolina Press. His previous book in 2013 was Power to the Poor, Black Brown Coalition and the Fight for Economic Justice. So we'll hear from Gordon next. Thank you, Juan. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago tomorrow, <laughs> the book came out. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And thank you for that kind introduction. Let's see here. All right. All right. I have a lot to, I, yeah, I, I really want to, um, I hope this builds on what Jacoby and Lilia both said. Um, some of the some of the concepts that um, are mentioned there, the difference between solidarity and coalition, visibility and invisibility, I think are really interesting uh, ones to explore. And so I hope we have a chance uh, to do that. Um, so uh, I, I'll start with this image of, of Harold Washington, pretty famous um, with the city in the background. Um, uh, and just talk about how th th this project in many ways started um, in my first book um, about the Poor People's Campaign um, when uh, Al Raby, who um, was the campaign manager for uh, for Harold Washington, talked about uh, that this campaign was the culmination, uh, a continuation of the Poor People's Campaign of Dr. King's um, 15 years before in the late 60s. And it's really how I came across this document uh, connecting uh, the 60s and the early 80s, along with, of course, a number of individuals like Raby and others um, that got me into this project uh, in the first place. Um, let me see if I can actually forward my screen here. Okay. Um, 
So I want to pick up on um, in the 1970s where the social movements of the 60s um, achieve um, quite a bit, certainly in terms of awareness. Um, but there is a moment in the 1970s, especially, you know, five, 10 years after the Voting Rights Act of, of, of 65, um, where political, really electoral politics becomes um, seen as the primary uh, vehicle for political empowerment for both African Americans and Latinos in many ways. Now, of course, in Chicago, that's been the case for a while. Um, African Americans have been elected um, since the 20s, uh, really the teens, um, uh, for, to the council and uh, to Congress since the 20s. Um, but as part of this machine that Teresa mentioned at the, at the beginning, and that we've we we've uh, we mentioned sort of throughout, uh, very controlled system where. If you play, you know, by the rules that Richard J. Daly and others have established, you can stay in power and you can exchange votes for small bit, small services, small favors, but never a challenge to civil, uh, to um, police brutality, to housing segregation, to unequal schools, to real, uh, to the real lack of of uh, economic opportunities uh, in most uh, poorer communities in the in the city. And so um, Rudy Lozano here on the left, who starts off as a Chicano movement leader in Pilsen and at UIC actually, um, uh, becomes a labor leader in the mid 70s. But by 19, the late 1970s, 79, 80, 81, uh, he and Chewy Garcia, young Chewy Garcia, Linda Coronado and others realize that um, electoral politics has to be part of the mix. They have to um, uh, maybe make some compromises, but to get involved in electoral politics, and that's how you bring about change. It's also happening at the same time where you see uh, the demographics in the city changing, um, where Latinos have become um, uh, not just you know three percent or so of the population, but closer to ten to fifteen percent of the city's population. Um, so Rudy's here on the left, um, Chacha Jimenez. Uh, in a coat and tie, runs for council in 1975 uh, in the 46th Ward, uh, Lakeview and Uptown. Uh, and he doesn't win, but it's an important moment uh, that kind of represents that that shift, that transition from, okay, um, the, the protest politics that we were pursuing is still incredibly important, and I'll get to that later, um, either in my remarks here or in the Q&A, um, but uh, uh, that has to go along with uh, electoral politics and trying to make a play for actual formal uh, power. The community, working class community of Pilsen becomes really important, and you um, to this kind of foundation that brings uh, Harold Washington uh, to power in 1983. If it isn't for this, uh, for Latinos, um, uh, the numbers don't really lie. Uh, Harold Washington doesn't win. He may win the primary uh, against uh, incumbent Mayor Jane Byrne and uh, young Richard M. Daley, who's the state's attorney at the time, and of course, a future mayor. Uh, he might win that primary, but Latinos become the difference between Harold winning and losing in the general election against uh, a Republican, which of course is seems see, seems unheard of uh, in such a democratic city. But that was uh, the reality. You hear see here the bottom after Harold uh, became mayor uh, at a parade with Chuy Garcia. You see some of. Um, uh, uh, Rudy Lozano's work as a labor leader before he uh, helps found the independent political organization of the near west side in 1981 that becomes uh, a key organization uh, in Harold's rise. So, and there's other movements going on as well. I think it's important to note um, Slim Coleman and Helen Schiller in the Heart of Uptown uh, Coalition housing activism, uh, certainly activism, black and white uh, and brown um, around police brutality, 
Uh, so you you start seeing, you know, you, you're, you're seeing this activism throughout the 1970s. Um, so Jane Byrne becomes mayor in 1979. Um, Someone who was part of the machine, actually a protege of, of Mayor uh, Daly, um, but after he dies in 1976, she finds herself on the outside and she runs as an outsider uh, and upsets Michael Belandic, who um, was the machine mayor um, for, two, uh, for two and a half years after Mayor Daly passed away. And key to her winning in 1979 was African-Americans and uh, some Latinos. But African-Americans are rewarded with supporting uh, Byrne uh, with betrayal. Um, she turns her back on them uh, pretty much right away. Um, and that starts off a process really uh, of uh, a really rejuvenated um, uh, a surge of activism um, that ends up convincing Harold Washington to run. Uh, the dis disillusionment, as I write here, uh, with Byrne and machine politics more generally leads to, among other organizations, the Chicago Black United Communities, founded by Lou Palmer, here uh, with the glasses uh, to the right of, of Mayor Washington. Um, and then uh, here's Helen Schiller, who many of you might know as uh, a, a relatively recent, re well, I guess it's been now 12 years that she retired uh, from the council. She has a book out herself, actually, but a really important um, activists around affordable housing uh, and just speaking for 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 uh, disenfranchised poor people sort of throughout the city and certainly in her ward. Um, so uh, these these folks and others, um, it, among other things, uh, register more than 100,000 people to vote. Uh, really in in uh, preparation for the 1982, uh, governor's race and congressional races, um, and nearly actually uh, uh, tips uh, the balance um, in those races, uh, but they become key uh, to Harold's uh, win the following winter in 83 in February and then uh, in the primary and then the general election uh, in April. And I'll get back again, the key, voter turnout is key. <clears throat> the turnout in 83, um, in the primary and then the general election is 70%. And if you notice in the the, the current um, elections, the one that we just had in February and the expectations for next Tuesday, um, they're more in the 30s. And I think that that's something that we have to think about. Why is that? You know, why are, we know the Chicagoans will come out to vote. 75% came out to vote in 2020 for the presidential race. So why are they, why are Chicagoans not coming out for this municipal election? Uh, and I have some theories about that, uh, but I think it's an interesting thing that for us to, uh, to, to talk about. Harold Washington, a charismatic and tireless campaigner, a really, a, a really special man in many, many ways. Um, I don't want to make a great man theory argument here, but he definitely is um, the right man at the right time, a person who can actually bring folks together and build on, uh, take that foundation of activist work and actually um, translate it into an electoral victory uh, in 83. And then again, uh, in 87, uh, when he is reelected. Here he is with Jane Byrne, who the two people he just vanquished, um, Jane Byrne and uh, a young Richard Daly, neither of whom um, actually do much to support him, even though they say they will support him in the primary. Um, and, you know, he survives uh, the general election and wins with 51% of the vote. And as I said, Latinos uh, are absolutely uh, key to him actually getting over the top and, uh, and winning. Um, and in part, um, in exchange for that, uh, Harold is, is uh, absolutely instrumental in Latino political empowerment during his administration in terms of championing the city as a sanctuary city, uh, establishing uh, Latino majority city council, uh, wards in a special election um, uh, in 1986, uh, and he doesn't see this, uh, he doesn't live to see this, but uh, a Latino majority congressional district in the early 90s as well. 
Moreover, he is known for um, um, being successful in terms of uh, distributing city contracts and jobs more equitably. Uh, so African-Americans and Latinos um, have a greater share of the pie uh, when it comes to how the city is run. Greater transparency more generally, uh, more neighborhood uh, development as well, or getting neighbors neighborhoods uh, more involved in the development process. Um, and uh, overall kind of a weaker patronage system that he champions uh, as well. But um, as so many folks will, might recall, um, he also faced remarkable racism, remarkable uh, white supremacy uh, by an entrenched white uh, majority in the city council that did everything in their power to stop him from achieving really anything, appointing his people, passing a budget, uh, making any of the reforms that he campaigned on. Um, and along, you know, with that continued deindustrialization, the larger macro economy hasn't changed overnight. Uh, a hostile federal administration um, run by Ronald Reagan, um, the rise of mass incarceration and the war on crime and the, you know, the war on drugs, uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, and then his premature death in 1987. Uh, kind of tempers his legacy in many ways. There's no question, as Teresa said, um, that he left an indelible mark on the city, uh, but it was not, um, governing was a hell of a lot harder uh, than winning a campaign. As hard as a campaign was, governing was uh, much, much more uh, difficult. And so the book in many ways spends uh, a good, the, the last third of it or half of it really focuses on um, that governing. So, um, you know, I'll just fast forward 40 years uh, to what uh, Chicagoans, the choice of Chicagoans face today. Uh, there are certainly parallels that you can see about um, can, um, I, well, either men could build a multiracial coalition. I think that uh, there would be very different kinds of coalitions um, that they're trying to build around different uh, uh, hopes and visions and values. Um, but uh, the question to you know for me that like, comes back to and that I wrote about in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago was um, how do you explain such low voter turnout? Um, is it because reform even the most well-intentioned, popular, uh, well-positioned person to put in, you know, to to bring reform um, to Chicago doesn't isn't able to do it fully, and that's a Harold Washington. Does that um, make it uh, seem impossible to achieve, no matter who it is? And is that why uh, turnout it continues to be so low? Anyhow, I I, I look forward to our conversation and your questions. And then I'll just give my quick plug for my book. There's the cover. You can see a young Chewy Garcia there came, um, at a parade uh, with Harold Washington in 1985. Thank you. Okay, Gordon, thanks for that. And now I'm gonna to try to throw out a few questions. Uh, uh, obviously this is great history and, um, and uh, but for a lot of, let's say the young people who are here, who are trying to deal with the current race that we have now, I think that one of the, Key concerns of mine is what are the lessons uh, from that period that could uh, could help guide people uh, in their organizing and in and in their participation in the current elections. Uh, I, I like to remind people that when David Dinkins ran for mayor of New York City in 1989, he was a Democratic Socialist. He was a member of DSOC, right? Uh, and yet his his administration left quite a, a bit of disappointment among many progressives, uh, uh, it, not just in the Latino community, but in the African-American community. So that the second uh, 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 election that between him and Rudy Giuliani, the turnout in the black Latino community was remarkably reduced. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering if there are lessons there for what might happen this coming, uh, this coming Tuesday in terms of those who seek to build multiracial coalitions and uh, as Gordon said, the problems of governance, uh, it's not just uh, espousing uh, progressive views, it's what do you do when you are faced with uh, developing progressive policies within a capitalist society, 
and the pressures that are on you uh, as a leader. So I'm wondering, each of you, what are some of the key lessons that you think uh, uh, young people today should draw from this past history? And uh, maybe we can begin with uh, Jacoby. Oh, thanks, Juan, for the question. So this is a number of lessons, so I, I limited it to one or two. Um, one, more importantly, uh, since you brought up the, the idea or the concept of socialism, I want to be clear that the Rainbow Coalition, most of what bound them together is socialism. They were democratic socialists. Martin Luther King, who was assassinated, was a democratic socialist, and the Panthers and his coalition saw themselves continuing that work. Um, you fast forward that to our current context today, uh, it's not by accident that uh, the most famous, most uh, progressive democratic socialist we have, Bernie Sanders, was recently in Chicago um, endorsing Johnson um, to create and continue these kinds of the legacies. So what I would say to students or, or, or the youth or those listening, if, if the Panthers can bring some Confederate flag wearing Southern whites, Puerto Ricans, Native Americans, and all those folks in that polarized, crazy environment, the 1960s where people are being assassinated, um, when Nixon is running on this, um, there's the, or, 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 or there's, um, uh, 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 campaign against crime would mean you see protests in the streets and these kinds of movements, there's criminal activity. There is no reason we can't um, force those same kinds of coalitions and organizations today with the height of Trumpism and DeSantis craziness and all the other uh, anti-DR, CRT, DEI materials and things that are taking place now. In fact, people are doing that work. Um, here's a, a, a shameless plug to Reverend Barber and Reverend Theo Harris and the, the new Poor People's Campaign and the work that they're doing. They're the epitome, in my opinion, uh, ex example of what the Rainbow Coalition looked like in 1968, 69 today. And just no, look no farther than the new Poor People's Campaign. So we are and continue to do that work that you can, and there's chapters. So I see this more of encouragement. The problem is, so this is what Gordon um, um, alludes to, allude to at the end of his talk, is the mobilization at the polls. Um, the most important voting bloc in uh, our entire society are the youth. They make up almost 35% of the entire voting block. Um, the problem is they only show up to the polls less than 20%. So they're giving their power away. And so if that's going to be the determining factor, in my opinion, of this campaign that takes place on Tuesday, who can mobilize um, those young voters? Who can actually get them to the polls? This is probably why Bernie Sanders is there to give this some media attention, to help in that regard. Um, and I think these, these kinds of efforts of of using the past, the Rainbow Coalition, the Washington Coalition, and all these various coalitions in the past to demonstrate that the change only flows through the youth of movements of the youth. Youth have always been the backbones of these, these change, these change agents and creating change. So we have to have the youth involved in that regard. I'll stop there because I, I'll get on my soapbox for the next 10 minutes. And uh, Lilia? Yeah, very quickly. I would just go back to one of the points I made earlier, which is um, that one of the most important lessons we can take away from, from this period is um, the importance of solidarity, you know, of, of really seeing an, uh, our shared humanity, what we have in common with, with one another, and working to um, lift up the most marginalized and the most oppressed among us. Because I want to make a distinction between what we often see as a kind of culprit, corporate multiculturalism, you know, um, as Juan pointed out in one of his uh, talks uh, when he left New York, um, you know, even the NBA has Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, splayed on, uh, on their courts, you know, at, at the games. What is that? You know, what, you know, the NBA, one of the wealthiest associations in, in our society and, and one of the most racist for crying out loud, right? So I think we have to look past just the empty rhetoric, look past the fact that Paul Vallis is featuring and highlighting African-Americans in his commercials very intentionally in his campaign ads, very intentionally to suggest this is the multiracial coalition or that he can build it um, without you know, really acknowledging some of the problems of, of his past policies. Um, I think that really centering that kind of um, solidarity and meaningful coalition um, are some of the most important lessons. And Gordon, I wouldn't ask you to chime in, but also with a little uh, different uh, bent is um, I was struck in your book by uh, your the history that you gave of some of the people who became part of the Harold Washington coalition who were originally part of the machine. <laughs> and, yeah. and that in fact, and that in fact that there I think there's a tendency to these days 
for people to assume that uh, alliances and, uh, and camps are permanent and not that there's constant change that you have to be willing to adapt to the changing conditions. A, a Ralph a Metcalf, for instance, going from becoming a machine politician to being an, a, a fighter for independent politics, uh, uh, or even Tim, Tim Evans having come out of the machine to become the candidate uh, and the standard bearer of the Harold Washington movement. You, you talk about that as well. The yeah, lesson exactly. of today of being too absolutist in how you see the political stands of different people. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a great question. Well, everybody um, kind of uh, learns how to do politics in Chicago, um, uh, at, in, in some in some way, either as part of the machine or not, or, or against the machine, right? And, but I I think you make a really good point that Harold is, you know, his father's in the machine. He's part of the machine. He's part of the Ralph Metcalf organization. Uh, he is a state legislator in, uh, in Springfield as a rep and then as a state senator. Uh, and it's only as a state senator when he runs for mayor the first time. And this is something I think that, you know, maybe a lot of folks might not know who are younger, that that Harold Washington ran before in 77. This is when he breaks with the machine very clearly. Although if you read his, he, he attempts to try, he attempts to not run against the machine. He says, no, 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 I just want to make the machine a better, more, more fair, right? And, and, um, and not, so he's actually not even at that moment uh, completely throwing it uh, away and under the bus, but he really learns his political chops in many ways uh, in that environment, right? I said Jane Byrne, right? So you you have three, uh, the, the machine loses um, three straight mayoral elections uh, and, and all three of them are to two people that were uh, learned how to do politics through uh, that uh, that organization, right? And so in Byrne in 79, and then Harold in, in 83 and 87. So you're right, you can change. And um, and and I would say that, I mean, for, for Metcalf that you mentioned before, uh, for Washington, for Tim Evans, they found, they were able to build a um, kind of a credibility in an organization and, and a base that way and then break away from the machine and do some of the things that they wanted to do, to do. I mean, it's it's pretty well documented that Harold didn't like a lot of things that the machine asked him to do. He sometimes kind of went along with it and sometimes he didn't uh, and played along the edge of getting um, unslated by uh, the party leaders. Um, but he just did just enough to stay connected and he was, everyone recognized what a uh, talented politician he was, and so they wanted him to stay in the folds of the of the family, so to speak. But um, yeah, they I've had that question multiple times. <laughs> the book's been out a couple of weeks, but that's something that folks always are find fascinating is that so many of them uh, uh, start in that in that machine space and then emerge out of it when there's an opportunity to do so. So that's a really good point. I think something else I would say. Um, I mean, coalitions are just fragile. They're they're inherently fragile. And my first book, I also explore this is just the, you know, you, you have to agree to disagree on many things and find common ground where you can. And I and I and I just I do want to echo what Lilia says and 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 Jacoby says as well as find the common humanity in everybody and realize you're not going to agree on everything. Uh, but you can still work together and make the um, society a better place, whatever, you know, whatever scope we're talking about. Um, Reverend Barber, one of my heroes, I lived in North Carolina for years and got to see um, uh, the Moral Mondays movement that be uh, then became the new Poor People's Campaign sort of uh, emerge. And um, uh, and I think he's a really good model and um, uh and that movement to uh, to really do um, you know do some of the things that Dr. King wasn't able to achieve before he was uh, assassinated and before the the Poor People's Campaign of '68 uh, occurred. Um, but I, you know, I think it really the other thing I would say is is um, it comes down to relationships, and that's a very very localized thing, right? Building relationships with people around you. Um, and um, again, finding common ground, that's what happens 
in Washington in 1968 during the Poor People's Campaign. That's what happens in the streets of Chicago among people in the 83 campaign, which really was a social movement in many ways. It had that kind of energy. Um, that's why people were like, you know, I'm going to drag my neighbor out to the polls. You know, he may say he doesn't want to go, but he's going to go with me. And uh, that kind of, uh, those kinds of efforts is really what made it happen. And I think that there's, um, I don't want to say a cynicism, but maybe it is a cynicism that it doesn't really matter in the sort of the larger corporate, um, uh, you know, culture that we live in, that it makes whoever says they're going to, they promise reform, they're not going to be able to do it, whether it's Jane Byrne or even Harold Washington or Lori Lightfoot or anyone in between, you know, so um, I think we have to combat that, obviously. Um, but uh, I think that that, you know, that's, we have to realize that, um, uh, that we can't agree with our neighbors necessarily on everything, but we can agree on them enough to be active and engage and and uh, uh, make the place a, uh, make the city a better place. So. I'm going to throw out another couple of quick questions. I'm going to take some from the audience. Uh, Jacoby, I wanted to ask you. I know you're particularly interested in how these the different campaigns, whether years back or today, use uh, crime and campaigning against crime uh, as a a, a stand-in. Uh, for uh, another kind of politics. I'm wondering if you could talk about that as well. Yeah, these, so crime or criminality, this is, this is not new tropes, right? This is why um, Chuck Geary and members of Joint Community Union, um, members of SDS, shout out to Bill Ayers and some of the other folks I see in the room and, and others, this way of doing this work. Nixon campaigned on these kinds of actions, right? The, this idea of organizing, your campaign around criminality, seeing protests in the street, um, the ways in which folks are fighting for their rights or the actions of all the poor people is criminality. So these are new tropes. Reagan did it, Nixon did it, our current violence is doing it. Um, but usually when you see crime, it's also racialized language. I hear black and brown um, in that. So how do we, what do we do against this fear using and mobilizing against fear in that regard? But the crime and in the past, uh, we looked then and now, most of this is taking place in by 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 means of the state. So the party is formed because of police brutality. That's what the that's the whole purpose of the Black Panther Party. The young patriots come to the fold because they're being called hillbillies, and who's who's abusing them? Chicago Police Department. So these poor people have something in common. They're youth, and they're all being subjected to police brutality. Whether they're Puerto Rican, poor whites, or African Americans, they're common denominators. That poverty and organizing and getting out the vote and mobilization. Uh, which make the Hell Washington campaign so important is the ways in which they targeted the youth. They used the youth, these members of these organizations, these coalitions, to go out and target the youth to register to vote. They have massive registration drives and at massive voter mobilization drive by targeting their communities and the youth in these ways. So that's what we need now in this current society, um, demonstrating to the youth how important local politics are. We only come out when we want to pose something we think is egregious or life-changing like voting against Trump or possibly DeSantis coming up, these presidential elections, but we don't show up in these midterms like now, these mayoral elections um, that are equally more important because those particular issues are gonna affect us the most. So for example, when, when, when a member like Hale Washington is part of the machine, uh, he begins to jump from the machine after um, he walked through that bullish ravaged apartment to witness the murder of Fred Hampton. And he, a lot of people begin to jump from the machine after witnessing Fred Hampton's murder. And then they pulled the coalition into the political arena because these folks were not politicians. Jose Chacha Jimenez and all these groups just worried about organizing their communities. They didn't want to be politicians. It's held Washington and other politicians who pulled them into the fold. Then their first campaign was against the state's attorney's office. So I use that as an example to mobilize um, young folks today that they actually voted him out of office. They mobilized and voted Republican against the Democrat. Got, for example, to get him out of office, uh, to put someone in that they thought would be more amenable to their, their, their constituency. So fast forward to today, I think the current debate between Johnson and Ballas, uh, Kim Fox's name continues to surface, for example. Why is she there? Because people on the ground, poor people, Black people, Latino people, progressives, organized, and especially the youth, to target what they saw as the number one problem with mass incarceration, which is the state's attorney's office and voted this person out, Nini Alvarez, and brought in 
of Kim Fox. And then she began to change the system from within. So you have to look at politicians locally. So criminality is always at the front and center of any of these particular elections, whether it's national or local. But typically when I hear crime, when I hear ballots who's endorsed by the fraternal order of the police, one of the most racist institutions in America, to be quite frank about it, that, that sends shields up my spine. That I don't believe that um, anything that you put forward in terms of your policy is going to benefit poor people, particularly black and brown folks in the city of Chicago, in any particular way without more policing. More policing means more arrests, more criminality, more abuse. Um, and those are rallying cries I think we can use, that can be used to mobilize the youth to see their, their, issues, their issues in a more salient lens, an immediate lens, that make them actually go to the polls. And my last question, and then I'm going to throw, throw it over to some questions from the audience. Uh, the role of class uh, in terms of maintaining uh, or sometimes splitting these coalitions. Uh, Gordon, in your book, you point out how the breakup of the Harold Washington coalition did not just occur along ethnic lines. Uh, there were a significant number of African-American aldermen who switched sides that fatal night when thousands, including Teresa, were around uh, C City Hall as the as the council was voting uh, to support uh, the uh, the candidate of the machine uh, to basically stop uh, the Washington movement. Uh, so the role of class in all of this. I mean, class. Yeah, I saw that question actually in the Q and A as well. I mean, class is absolutely essential, right? And and uh, yeah, we we it's. I mean, it's not one or the other, it's both. It's along with gender, right? Gender is also essential uh, to thinking about um, how race and class is in, employed and how's a, how it plays out on the ground. I mean, I would say that, you know, the the uh, the folks that benefit the most in some ways from the Washington administration are uh, middle-class African-Americans and, and Latinos, right? Um, well, you have, the I mean, the same time, um, there are, you know, there certainly are um, uh, more appointments and more um, uh, African-American uh, men and women and Latinos, uh, men and women who are in positions of power eventually, especially by 1987, um, the patronage is being weakened at the same time. And so the, um, uh, the ability to be able to share, distribute um, city jobs, low level city jobs for working class folks uh, is less so. And Washington re really doesn't seem to philosophically believe that that's, that that's the way you do business. Um, exchanging votes for jobs. And, uh, uh, but it creates, it really, it, it actually creates um, a contradiction within this coalition where there's some folks that are like, no, 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 we deserve it. It's our, it's our chance to get all the jobs that white ethnics got all those years, right? Whether you're Irish, Italian, Polish, or something else. Um, but um, under the Shackman decree and the other efforts to like weaken patronage, um, that actually doesn't happen. So you start seeing a break, I think, along class lines in terms of who benefits the most from this administration. And of course, that's also increasingly happens through ne neoliberal policies as well in the late 80s and, uh, and through the 90s uh, onward. Okay, well, uh, let's go to some of the audience questions. Here's one from a couple of people uh, about the city council. Uh, how do you see the city council as either acting to assist the implementation of progressive policies or alternatively as a bulwark against conservative policies if, depending on who wins uh, uh, the mayoral race? I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that in particular. I mean, the current city council, and you know, I'm not in Chicago now, and so I, you know, I, I would, I'd be curious to hear what um, uh, uh, y'all say. But I mean, it is definitely a more diverse uh, council than it was in 1983 or 87 in terms of ideology um, and uh, the, a social democratic caucus. There, I mean, there, there, there are real, there are some real. Um, I think. Uh, the, the, I, I guess, yeah, the lack of a better term of diversity of ideology uh, in the caucus now. And there's also a lot of turnover, right? So whoever the new mayor is will have, what, a, th a third new council members. Um, and whether or not that means that the council will be stronger or weaker, I'm not sure. Um, but 
it's uh it's not it's probably not going to be hardened in the same way as for and against the way that you saw in 1983 where you had 29 people against Harold and everything he did and 21 for and then eventually that flips to 20 you know 25 25 or 27 23 it, it I think you might see more fluidity between um council uh sort of the fraction the sort of different sub uh sections of the of the council now here's another question uh from uh the audience uh didn't Obama's fake change do a lot to teach people to be cynical and apathetic? Uh, I don't know if anybody want to tackle that one. Fake change? Um, I, I don't want to say it was fake. I think he actually believed um, much of what he campaigned upon. Um, but this idea of change never occurred. So he, he was reminded um, with a heavy hand um, how staunch and how um, entrenched, intrinsic white supremacy is and special interests particularly sometimes connected in those regards. This also relates to the um, previous question, the automatic questions of those city councilmen, um, as we can see how the endorsements are playing out, for example, um, in this particular election, you know, who are beholden to whom, um, mostly it has to do with money and campaign capitalism always wins out and special interests. Uh, so even with the turnout rate, how do we, uh, well, I would say we, the current mayor, whoever is elected, hopefully not ballots, um, real in, those particular people into one's ideological approach. Uh, you can see even Lori Lightfoot struggle with that uh, for over a number of occasions. So one, black and brown people are not monolithic. That's one issue. Um, and then class does play a, a big role in that. And then special interests. As you can see that Vallis likes to continue to focus on business, 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 business. When I hear business, 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 that means poor people, you don't matter. <laughs> it's just the, the, the centrist approach again here that you got in which was part of the Obama campaign. Um, you, you hear it was Obama, Clinton, whoever, it doesn't matter what Democratic candidate is, they're always talking about the middle class, the middle class, the middle class. But what about us who aren't middle class, which a lot of the Chicago's made up, especially, I'm from Inglewood. I mean, a lot of us are not middle class. Do we not matter to you? And so this is why I appreciate people like Johnson um, and the ways in which he's focusing the conversation back on the people and the people's interests, not special interests which is what these aldermen and some of those issues have to deal with. So when you talk about fake um, change, uh, change is hard, um, but it's also a mobilizing tool. So I wouldn't call it fake. That idea of change, the idea of hope is what got people to the polls. So you have to use those kinds of language and rhetoric to mobilize the base, to mobilize voters to come out. And people voted against their interests on, on behalf of Obama because of these ideas that he can create change and create hope. So you have to motivate people, you have to inspire people and that's so I don't see it as fake in that regard. He did his job. It got people to the polls, got them elected and reelected uh, in that regard. And so now governing is totally different. But so running one campaign, running a campaign is one thing, but governing is totally different. Now, did he actually adhere to some of that change when he was elected? I will say no. But in terms of campaigning, uh, it was a great mechanism and method for getting people to the polls, large turnouts. I mean, African Americans voted in the 90 percentile. We never do that in an election. Right, we put them in office because of this idea of change of hope. So it's not fake um, in that regard. Uh, another question from the audience is: Coalition building more successful when there are fewer but much stronger and more visible underlying organizations like the Panthers, Lords, and Rainbow Coalition versus many smaller uh, uh, underlying organizations. In other words, is quality stronger than quantity when building coalition force uh, and um, uh, and does that have any impact on being able to mobilize large numbers of people to vote? That's, uh, that's an organizer's question there. So <laughs> I don't know, Lilia, do you want to take a shot at that or? I think there are uh, many other people much more uh, better qualified to answer that than me. But, you know, what I would say is that, you know, coalition um, building is difficult. And within any organization, there are always going to be fractures, differences of opinion, I think as Gordon suggested earlier. Um, and, you know, it, it's hard work. It's hard work. And so I think at the end of the day, you really need to um, determine what you are committed to, what you are committed to doing and what your ultimate goal is beyond the personalities, beyond the differences of opinion, beyond the kind of, you know, um, contests for power or for status, um, et cetera. So I'm sorry, I can't offer a better answer, but um, uh, I, 
we'll defer to Gordon or Jacoby. I mean, I, I would just say who is more prominent than the Chicago Teachers Union and the Fraternal Order of Police? <laughs> if you're thinking about two of the most prominent organizations that are in the, you know, part of the the moment that we're in on the on on these two sides, I mean, they're they're they seem to me include a lot more people and have a lot more sort of name recognition in some ways than the organizations that we wrote about for, you know, uh, from 40, 50 years ago. So um, I, you know, I, I, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think that you obviously, obviously have to have resources and um, uh, a, a willingness to, I, as I said, agree to disagree sometimes with folks about certain issues because there's a larger vision that you're trying to ch achieve. Uh, and then share that power, right? Um, so a willingness to sit at the table and say and and kind of um, give uh, give and take. Um, and you know, I think that that's what ends up happening in the the Washington coalition in many ways, how the, there's a shared vision of the machine is the enemy, and we have a, a better, uh, greater vision for the city. Um, and this is the best vehicle to do this. And then there's a lot of disagreement about how then to put that into place afterwards. Um, but, you know, they had agreed at least th th that far to, to, to work together, right? So, um, so I don't know, yeah. I wanna get another question here uh, from somebody in the audience. Uh, Chewy Garcia has been such a vital part of Chicago history. Any thoughts on why he felt so flat in this most recent primary? And uh, also, I think, uh, Gordon, it, it, maybe you want to answer this, because in your book, you talk a lot about how Harold Washington had to sometimes fight key leaders in the Black community to uh, empower and, uh, and maintain the unity with the Latino, with, La with uh, Latino leadership. And I'm wondering if you're seeing the same kind of effort or outreach uh, from, because uh, Chewy has endorsed uh, uh, Brandon Johnson, but uh, there's the endorsement and then there's endorsement. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, how uh, how strong are those bonds uh, that Washington worked so hard to build between African Americans and Latinos? <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's obviously, <laughs> it's not a natural coalition. I mean, I think that, it, it, I mean, I, I think that we shouldn't presume that every, that there are natural alliances. They always have to be worked at, right? They always have to, the, the, the notion um, that uh, African Americans and Latinos, they ha certainly have sh uh, uh, shared concerns, but they have also distinct historical trajectories and, 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 and histories, right? And uh, just like <laughs> um, Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans and Cuban Americans, for instance, and you know, all also have their own distinct uh, experiences and uh, upper class or elite African American business uh, elites versus working class folks, right? Um, I mean, that you know, th there are lots of ways to, um, uh, no group is monolithic. Um, and so it has to be constantly worked at. And um, uh, yeah, there there's, uh, something I write about in my first book in particular is this, this kind of a notion of an activist hierarchy where, uh, many civil rights uh, activists say in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Dr. King's um, uh, organization really saw, okay, we want to work with Latino activists or at the time, you know, the Mexican American or uh, Hispanic activists, so they would say, uh, but they have to understand that they're junior partners because we've uh, um, suffered much more so. Um, and, you know, Dr. King and other people were like, that's not Super. I want to learn. That's not really helpful <laughs> in in us uh, working together. Uh, and I think that Harold also saw the same way. Is that um, you know I we need to listen to each other uh, and and build common bonds that way, right? And so he recognized that he was put into power uh, by an overwhelming black vote. That you know, any part of this coalition that's not there, he doesn't win whether it's African-Americans, whether it's progressive whites on the lakefront, whether it's Latinos, any one of those groups uh, that's not, that isn't present, he ends up uh, remaining a congressman. Uh, and I think that he recognized that and said, I have to manage 
all these folks' expectations. Uh, and his aides uh, saw it the same way, although I think he he often had to push back against his aides who said, no, no, we don't want a mayor's advisory commission on Latino affairs because that could be a runaway commission that will just criticize us, you know, and that's what they threatened to do. And he was like, no, 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 we're going to actually establish this. So we at least have some, um, uh, we have a relationship with this, with this group, right? Uh, and yeah, we see this over and over again, I think, in terms of um, uh, trying to balance needs uh, among uh, everybody. Chuy Garcia is very, very loyal to to Harold in many ways, right? And uh, I mean, I put him on the cover of my book not knowing he was going to run for mayor. Um, <laughs> and I think that, you know, um, uh, I think it's fair to say that he ran an unenergetic campaign and thought that a lot of the polls suggested that he was pro he was going to get into the runoff um, and that he would pick up the energy after that. But of course, that's not what happened. Um, and uh, I think there's also maybe a, do I really want to be, this is the last thing I'll say, do, do I really want to be mayor or do I want to be a congressman? Remember, Harold was like, I like being a congressman. This is a great job. Why would I ever want to do anything other than be a congressman, you know? And, uh, but, you know, if you're a politician in Chicago, being mayor um, is like the pinnacle of your career, but it's a job that's almost impossible at the same time. And I... But um, in terms of Troy Garcia, um, these are, I knew he was going to run. I mean, that was obvious. He ran the last two times. Now, this divide and conquer issue in terms of race is real. Um, it just played out during the Rahm Emanuel election, the ways in which Rahm Emanuel was able to give special favors to certain key Black leadership. And then you get this misinformation through the Black community that if he's elected, more jobs and resources are going to go to Latino communities sense of African-American communities. And that pushed a lot of people over the polls uh, against Chuy Garcia in that election, for example. Um, some of this also played out during Lori, Lam Lori Lightfoot's election, but not to the crass extent that it did during Rahm Emanuel's in terms of the ways in which he put certain key stakeholders, African-American ministers, for example, in particular offices within the state as concessions, is how patronage and machine works, is machine politics again um, in a different way. And that divide and conquer um, worked in that regard to circumvent the vote from Chewy when it should have been more of a coalition. We see a lot of this playing out now uh, with Madison Johnson. Some of those same people um, in those Rahm Emanuel circles from back in the day, from the last two elections, brother, um, are now you know, with that rearing their heads again, um, even in retirement with people like Jesse White and others. Um, so you make it, it forces me to say what who's been paid off where, what incentives, what patronage is taking place. Uh, with certain deals and backdoor deals and guns. Politics. Chicago politics is messy. Um, it's corrupt in a whole number of ways, but that's the way politics is done in the city. Um, and you can see a lot of that playing out now, except not against a Latino candidate, but against an African-American candidate. It's the same playbook um, that was used against Chewy is now being used against Johnson. Okay, well, uh, there's lots more to talk about, but we're out of time. <laughs> and so I want to I want to thank uh, all three uh, panelists for a ter terrific uh, conversation: Gordon Mantler, Lilia Fernandez, Jacoby Williams. I want to thank again Teresa uh, for and Great Cities for hosting this, as well as the Department of History uh, at UIC for uh, co-sponsoring. Thank you all for attending. Don't forget. Vote on Tuesday and tell any and call up all your cousins and your family members and everyone else and remind them vote on Tuesday because I always say as a former young lord one of the biggest mistakes we made in the New York young lords was not getting involved in electoral politics either during when we were at the height of our support or in the years afterwards uh, that we maintained that elections don't matter that that they're all capitalist elections anyway, so why you're not never going to change the system? Well, the reality is that you can make change, but it's not easy. Uh, and uh, and often it's harder to govern than it is to run. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming, uh, attending this evening and uh, have if a I good could, weekend. If I, could make, if I could make one last plug also, I want to encourage, especially the young people or those of you who are not familiar, um, with the work of our panelists. Uh, they are all amazing scholars, uh, Juana journalist, 
Um, but please go out and look for their books. Um, Jacoby from the Bullet to the Ballot. Gordon's got two books, The Multiracial Promise and Power to um, the Poor People's Movement, you know, or Power to the Poor. Teresa has written a number of really amazing essays. And Juan, of course, um, has written a number of books uh, and uh, countless columns. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is great. Thank you. My friend told me. And we will send you the link for the video once we post it. Thanks again, everyone.